All right. Good morning. It looks like we are live. Welcome to another Finance and Darby Network webinar brought to you by CFO South Africa. As you join us, please go ahead and type in the chat. Let us know your role and organization. And as soon as we some as soon as we see some of those comments coming through, we'll know that we are live. Thank you, Nick. Good morning. Wait for a couple more responses to come in. So we've got several more people joining us. So welcome, and as you join, just go ahead and let us know your role and organization in the chat, please. There we go. Thank you, Michael. Now we know that we are live. Perfect. So welcome to another Finance and Darbo Network webinar brought to you by CFO South Africa. Uh, it's no surprise that 2020 has been an incredibly challenging year for all of us. And uh, the role of finance has changed significantly over the, the last few years. So this morning we'll be in conversation with uh, Marlene van der Waal, who's the CFO of Investec Specialist Bank. And we'll also be in discussion with Audrey Mbuyazi, who's the business solution lead over at Oracle. So Marley and Audrey, if I could ask you just to jump on camera real quick. Thank you so much. And Audrey, if you can turn your camera on as well. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the session. Good Thanks, morning. John. Great being here. Thanks, Great. John. Great to be here. Awesome. Perfect. So um, Marley, let's, let's start with you. We know that uh, this has been an incredibly challenging year um, for a number of us. And certainly when you and I had a bit of a, a prep conversation in the build up to this, you, you mentioned that you had experienced your own fair share of challenges. But I think just before we kick things off, maybe you can share a little bit about your journey and how you got to, to where you are today. Uh, we know that you studied BCom accounting through Stellenbosch. You went on to become a CA uh, and you've also done various courses through Harvard as well. You worked over at um, Nedbank and Absa prior to your tenure stint over at uh, Investec now. So maybe you can just kind of set the tone and let us know how you got to where you are today. Cool. Thanks, John. Yeah, I, um, I must be honest. I think before before this, I, th I thought my, my stint starting in corporate just outside of um, just after articles, I thought was the was a baptism by fire, you know, but this has certainly surpassed that. So yeah, I real quick studied at Stellenbosch, did a year academic articles, which means um, you lecture for a year, um, then did two years articles with PwC in Durban, um, stayed on as a manager for a year and then joined BOE. So I wanna just pause there for a bit. Um, when I joined BOE, BOE, it was on at the beginning of 2001 and um, for those of you who know the history of banking a little bit, that's when Samba went under and when there was a run on the bank, a run on BOE. So shortly after I joined BOE, there was a run on the bank and then NetBank took them over. So um, so that was my start um, in corporate, you know, with a run on the bank and running loads and loads of models, you know, um, in a crisis period. So that was a, a bit of a baptism by fire. But um, like I said to the guy who hired me at the time is that, you know, I can put on my CV, I learned as much in six months as you would learn in two years in corporate, you know. So yeah. it, it literally was a great, great um, time to learn. I mean, it's not a great time for anyone to live through. I think similar to what people are experiencing today. Um, fast forward on that, you know, three years later, we were ring fenced as a division at the time because we made loads of losses. We turned the business around. Three years later, there was a big restructure at NetBank where they brought all the brands together, including People's Bank at the time. I moved up to Joburg um, to be the CFO of the retail banking services um, division at the time. Was there for a bit and then moved to APSA. Um, started a new audit function to audit all the Basel stuff. And then a few years later, moved to Investec, where I've been for, for 10 years now in, in various different roles, you know. So, mm. so I've certainly um, been around the block for a bit. You know, like I say, I think this um, is the, the biggest crisis I've seen after, you know, the, the sort of some banks folding in 2001. Um, yeah. And then obviously the global financial crisis also that we lived through. Yeah. 
Uh, it sounds like some of those challenges that you experienced earlier on in your career definitely um, set you up for, for what we're going to be speaking about today because we know that when lockdown commenced and when the uh, uh, coronavirus sort of broke out here in South Africa, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Molly, it was just as we entered lockdown, you're about uh, four days away from your year end. Right? So maybe you can just give us uh, a glimpse of that nightmare and how that kind of turned your world upside down. That's correct, John. Yeah, I must say, um, luckily, I mean, it was a bit different to my experience in 2001. In 2001, I was building models late at night and over weekends and I had to drive down to the internet cafe to mail my models. Now, at least this time I could sit at home in a comfortable chair with internet. Um, you know, but like you said, we were four days away from our year end when we entered lockdown. So um, generally at Investec, we do budgets and three-year plans in January, February. We start running our macroeconomic scenarios to predict our expected losses, you know, for our year end. We start running our models in terms of valuations and stuff, you know, um, sort of in February. So all in preparation for, for March, you know, and then suddenly sort of March comes and you see this huge volatility. And also mm. we obviously had forecasts in terms of where we would end our year, you know. And, um, you know, in the, the next sort of week or two weeks, you spend redoing everything that you've been doing for eight weeks. You had to redo basically in, you know, a few days, you know. We had to redo forecasts, redo three-year plans because, you know, as part of signing off here and you need to, so do a viability study and make sure that you're a going concern, you know. So for that, you yeah. need to look forward. So um, so read it three-year plans, read it capital plans, you know, read it budgets, read it the forecast for year in, tracked, you know, the losses that was coming through the market every day, you know, redo the macroeconomic scenarios because at the same time, South Africa was also downgraded in that last week of March, if you can remember. Yeah. So read it all our macroeconomic scenarios, reran all the valuations and all our expected loss calculations. So wow. so it was quite quite a hectic period, you know, yeah. for us um, to to do all of that stuff. But you know, as I say to people. You know, it was actually a blessing because we had work to do, you know. For many people sat at home and they didn't have anything to do. And I'd rather be in a situation where you're overworked, you know, than in a situation where you actually don't have work and there's no revenue earned in your company, you know. So those those are some of the things that people have experienced, you know, where literally businesses shut their doors and there was just no revenue coming into those businesses, which was quite a sad time for many of the people in our sure. economy. Yeah, thanks Molly. Um, it sounds like a really kind of hectic situation to cram what almost sounds like a full year worth of work into kind of two weeks and pressures must have been incredibly high. Um, obviously communication would be key, but what, how did you and your team, what, what were the skills you think that you possessed uh, to help you get through that that process. I mean, a full year's worth, worth of work in a couple of weeks, it's it's insane. Yeah, look, I think the people have had an incredible, incredible attitude, you know. Um, I, you know, it, it's just, you know, I can't thank the team enough, you know, for the way they've showed up, you know, the way that people just took this and, and just ran with it because people did work incredibly hard, you know, and, and also for a lot of people are parents, you know, so there was online schooling going on mm. somewhere in the background at the same time. So it, it was very, very hard for people, you know. So, um, you know, so the, sh the sheer sort of um, determination just to push through, you know. Um, so we obviously stayed very close as a team, you know. Um, we had daily check-ins, you know, um, helping people just to cope with some of the situations, you know, making sure everyone's informed because a lot of the times um, it does help if you know what's happening. You know, if you're sort yeah. of sitting in the dark and you've got lots of doubt, then it's 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 even harder, you know. So staying close to people, you know. Um, and then also, I mean, we've got incredible technology these days, you know, and we also try to equip people. You know, I remember a year ago, we rolled out teams, you know, and People were talking about what's this team's not everyone knew about it. And suddenly, you know, in lockdown, within 
I mean, our IT people were incredible, you know, like the, when we heard it's going to be locked down, that week they came around to most people, you know, showed them about Teams, showed them Webex, you know, stuff like that. Because within a week, you know, you had full adoption of these technologies, you know, which yeah. were rolled out a year before. So, so those are some of the things that, you know, the technology, you know, making sure that as a human organization, I mean, so, um, Investec is a very relational organization to stay close to your people, you know, mm. and then, um, and I think just the, the, the type of people, you know, that we've got in the organization, incredible, resilient, determined, you know, um, and that was, you know, with a positive attitude. I think that's what brought us through this whole process. Yeah. In Investex, obviously very well known in the market as a, an organization or a company that's got sort of incredible culture. And obviously when we're seeing each other every day and we're walking past each other in the corridors and we can walk over to each other's desks, it's a lot easier to kind of contain that culture and manage it. Um, have you been able to do that through a virtual environment over the last seven or eight months? Yeah, look, I, I mean, that it's, it's something that's difficult, but you know, it's incredible some of the ideas people came up with. You know, we would, on a Friday evening at six o'clock, we would like just have a meeting and just all have a drink together, you know, we'll yeah. show, uh, we've lit the braai, you know, and you'll show, you know, here I'm lighting my, my braai, you know, and have a drink together. Um, you know, some people had um, comedy nights, you know, um, yeah. we like literally, you know, virtual comedy nights um, and um, had some music nights also, you know, in terms of just to keep that going, you know, HR also had a few wellness programs also, okay. you know, in terms of just to help people with different things, you know, anything from, you know, where you can just chat to someone to um, yoga, virtual yoga and things like that, you know, so, mm -hmm. so we've really tried during this time to, you know, to bring people along and not to, to lose that relational culture, you know, especially, I mean, we had virtual baby showers, you know, we had, wow. you know, all sorts of, all yeah. sorts of things, you know, and you need to come up with innovative ideas to make it interesting because you can't all just sit there looking at each other, you know, so, mm. so various websites where there's quizzes or, you know, where you put up pictures and fastest finger, you know, and, and all sorts of, of, of things that we've come up with to just make life a bit more interesting and a bit more normal and just to keep that rela those relationships going. Yes. Okay, cool. That's awesome. Thanks, Marla. Um, You mentioned earlier the, the importance of mindset and I think the, the traditional view of a finance professional and accountant is that they sit in a corner office, they're a bean counter, um, and obviously our topic here today is all about staying relevant in finance. So if you can just speak a little bit more around the components of mindset, um, how you focus on that personally, how you challenge yourself, and then maybe how you instill that in, in your team as well to make sure that they, they remain relevant too. Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I think, John, as we chatted previously, I mentioned to you like a lot of people almost treat corporate life um, like climbing a mountain you know it is it's obviously a quite a quite a task you know and people climb the mountain and some climb quicker than other and they reach the top and they just sit you know and they enjoy the view and sometimes people can sit there for 20 30 years just enjoying the view you know it's like yeah. you know so um whereas for me you know and what we definitely as a team try and do is that it's more like the sort of the mindset of a sports person, you know, um, okay. if if you um, if you want to stay on top of your game, and it's any sports person, whether you're a you know short distance athlete or a longer distance athlete or a tennis player, soccer player, you know, is um, what's got you there is not going to keep you there if you don't yeah. keep on exercising, you know. So like you might have won the Olympic gold today, but I mean, if you want to win at the next meeting, you know, you have to take a day, couple of days off and then you need to go back to training, you know, and you need to make sure you stay on top of what's out there, you know, new training methods, new shoes, new technology, even in, you know, in, in ath um, athleticism, these, these new technologies, you know, so you need to, to go back and start again, basically, and make sure that you maintain that level, you know, even as a golfer, you know, you always need to maintain that level. 
Yes. And that's the mindset that I feel that we need to have. You know, we need to keep on raising the game. We mm. um, we can't just arrive and then think we can sit there for the next 20 years. We need to keep on innovating. We need to keep on flexing those muscles, you know, training those muscles, looking at new technologies, looking at different ways of, of doing things. And that's the mindset that one should always have, not that I've arrived and now I can sit back and relax. Yeah. Okay, so it, it sounds like it's all about avoiding that sort of um, complacency. So I think for ourselves, it's a little bit easier to challenge or set goals. So would you build in specific like KPIs or uh, measurables for your team to ensure that they keep pushing themselves and learning? Yeah, I mean, our motto in the team is hashtag um, pushing the limits, you know, okay. so... Um, and it and it is all about how can we do things faster, quicker, and with less manual interaction. You know, yeah. I think ultimately, you know, I'm still asking, and I know Audrey from Oracle's on the line. Where's the button I can push that says start month in, and then I can make a cup of tea or something, and then I can come back and it will just give me a message to say month end finished. You know, so yeah. um, so that's basically what we trying to do is we're trying to get to that situation where you know most of the stuff is automated and what we do is we actually do the stuff that you don't need compute or you can't you, computers can't do that that easily you know like yeah. the analysis the insight you know the value you know for the business how do you pull levers differently so to really bring the insight you know into finance and the manual stuff that needs, if you need to do the same thing every month, you know, that task needs to be automated, really. So so that yeah. you are freed up to bring the insight um, and that can make the business move forward. So that's, mm -hmm. that's basically what we're trying to achieve. Okay. And it sounds like you've done a, well, not it sounds like you've definitely done a, an effective job of that if we look at where we were in March uh, and where you find yourselves today. So that's definitely been well executed. One of the other things that we also discussed, Marla, we've, we've spoken a little bit about um, legacy is no longer enough and, you know, climbing the sort of corporate ladder shouldn't be, it shouldn't lead to complacency. So if you had some suggestions or tips for people who are at the top, other than constantly evolving and ensuring that we, we're staying up to date with technology and information, but also for our emerging finance leaders, our aspirational finance professionals who have their eye on the, the CFO role? What, what tips and advice would you have for them? Yeah, so I think, um, John, the first thing, the mindset is the most important. You know, it, it is definitely, most in life is about attitude and aptitude, you know, more than technical skill. You know, um, so, and I, and I think it's never been more relevant than, than today around mm -hmm. how you evolve. You know, um, I mean, can you think, if we were still writing up ledgers, you know, in triplicate, you know, with carbon paper and stuff like that, I don't think anyone would have wanted to be an accountant today. So, um, so the technology is ever evolving. So you need to stay up to date in terms of what's out there. The ways that you can do it is obviously um, stay close to your IT partner. You can read yourself. There's a lot of stuff, you know, there's a lot of, um, blogs and, and um, technology papers that come out, you know, that, um, I mean, you guys publish a lot of stuff around in, in CFO magazine, you know, in terms of, of new developments. And there's a lot of, of digital articles as well, um, you know, and then engaging with your tech partners, you know, like the oracles, like um, these, these new fintech partners all the time that wants to um, engage with you around their products. Sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to make the time, you know, um, mm. but it's important to engage those people because they bring ideas, you know. So maybe you don't go with what they, the product they've got, but at least you are up to date in terms of what's in the market, you know, and maybe it's not their product, but something similar, or you get an idea of how people are thinking differently about stuff. So it's very important to, to remain up to date around, around the technology and how it evolves, you know. And then I think the last thing is also that we can never say, well, we've tried that, you know, because yeah. try if we tried something five years ago, it's very different today. Things sure. evolve and change so quickly. You have to keep trying, you know, um, 
because a lot of people say, oh, no, we've tried that like 10 years ago, you know, but where would we have been, you know, if the Wright brothers, for instance, just tried to fly once and they said, no, this will never work because we've crashed, yeah. you know, you have to try and try again, you know, so um, because just because it didn't work, you know, a few years ago doesn't mean it won't work into the future and things yeah. evolve. So it becomes becomes easier to to make things work. Mm, thanks, Marlo. That's perfect. Um, obviously, Investec have quite a big um, Oracle stack, and you mentioned that they were pretty instrumental and incredibly helpful in obviously getting through this um, entire journey. You mentioned stuff to me. Uh, it was around uh, reporting, where because they're obviously a US-based company and they uh, release results every sort of quarter, you were able to achieve that in, in 10 days, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so 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 Oracle, for instance, I mean, it's one of the. I mean, we we also engage with them obviously all the time, but we've engaged oh. with their finance team a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago, and um, just to understand how, as a global company, they do their financial reporting, and yeah. they are able to release results to the market in ten days. You know, okay. to the market. Um, yeah. You know, because obviously in the US they do quarterly reporting. And and when I say ten days, it's ten calendar days, not ten working days. You know, so which makes it very very impressive. You know, so so we try to close our ledger by the third working day, but I mean we're going to release results. You know, on the nineteenth of November. You know, for a thirty September. So we definitely not at ten days to market. You know, Oracle yeah. is as I said, which is very impressive. We're trying to to follow in their footsteps. Um, but I mean, they definitely have a very good stack, you know. And like I said, we're using a lot of that. It's really helped us a lot during this um, lockdown period, you know, in mm. terms of, you know, the the tools we use for for budgeting, forecasting are all Oracle tools, you know. So they're dynamic, um, you know, and it makes a huge difference, you know, in in terms of our lives. That's perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Marle. Um, in a moment, we we're going to hear from Audrey, but I wanted to check in with you and see if you had. Any final tips that you'd like to share with the audience here to help them navigate some of the challenges that they're currently going through and to ensure that they stay relevant in finance? No, look, I, I think it, it, it's all about a mindset. I think life life is a mindset. You know, some people go through the same experiences and some come out the other the other side quite positive and upbeat and have learned something and some people it breaks them you know so so I think it it is the mindset is important I think it's important to keep trying you know mm -hmm. um yeah and and to just keep on engaging keep on networking keep on communicating you know and that's the way that that you'll learn and you'll grow you know we can't grow on our own you know we need um other people we need a community, we need an environment, you know, to grow in. So keep engaging, you know, keep networking and keep reading. Yeah, that's perfect. Awesome. Well, I thank you so much for sharing some of your tips and advice. Uh, in the chat, if you've got questions for Marle, you can go ahead and type them in the chat. And towards the end of our uh, session here with Audrey, we'll go ahead and open up the floor to live Q&A. Also, there were some questions that were asked in the build-up to this webinar, so we'll definitely be sure to respond to those. Uh, and if we don't get around to answering your specific questions here today, we'll be sure to follow up with you within uh, a couple of days with a direct mail um, about how, or just with the, the answers to your questions. So Audrey, if I can ask you to uh, jump on camera for us real quick. Hi, John. Thank you so much and good morning. Good morning, good morning. So Audrey, you've obviously had a, a very interesting journey. You also studied uh, BCom and Information Systems, and you've been involved in various different roles with Oracle, if I'm not mistaken, for about a 20-year period, both on-site and off-site with different clients. I have indeed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think you might be oh, there we go. I thought you were on mute, but it seems like there's just a bit of a delay. Okay, perfect. Audrey, maybe similar to Marle, if you can just set the tone for us, let us know how you find yourself um, in the role you're currently in here today. Well, I started off uh, wanting to go the CA route. And so I did a double major at UCT with uh, accounting and, and information systems. But uh, after sort of doing my first year of articles, realized, oh, this is not for me. 
and I joined a, a research laboratory in the UK as a user in the fixed assets area. So I, I had to go on a course and learn they were actually implementing fixed assets for the first time. And um, I started there and loved it. Now this was version 10.7, that's a long time ago. And okay. uh, loved Oracle so much that about 18 months later, I actually joined Oracle as a consultant in the UK and did many implementations of the finance system there. Uh, worked in the UK, worked in Italy, did a couple of uh, uh, Nike, for example, in the Netherlands. And, uh, and then I decided to move into the skills development area and started training. I was training either consultants or users okay. and very involved, obviously, in the change management process. And I think that's where it sort of led me to where I am now, where um, I'm, I'm working on change management, mm -hmm. but really more from a business solutions, um, looking at how organizations are where they're at and where they could be and certainly using our solutions to get them where they could be. I have a feeling that my okay. camera is switched off, but I Perfect. hope you can see me. Yeah. Uh, we, we can still hear you loud and clear. It could just be due to bandwidth, so no worries. As long as we can hear you, that's, that's the main thing. Love so thanks, Audrey, for, for that bit of an intro. Um, Obviously, in your 20-year tenure over at Oracle, you've worked with hundreds of different clients over the years, and you've obviously helped them to navigate pretty difficult times like uh, market collapses, recessions, and now obviously what, what we're going through with uh, the corona pandemic. So I wonder if you could just share some of the, the patterns that have started to emerge, and maybe can share some pointers in terms of how we can better prepare ourselves for the future, and most importantly, how we can stay relevant in finance. John, that's really a, a sort of a very interesting area to, to look at. And I think I want to just sort of maybe point out three things. Um, the one is I would entitle evolve or expire. And uh, I, I think when I think about that, I like to think of things very much in a in a everyday world. In everyday world, if I am a you know a person who's a height of um, uh, you know one point five, which I am a one point five, I can pretty much find clothes you know even in the teenage section or you know. But if I am a two meter tall person, it means I have got to go to a specialist shop, and those specialist shops are very few and far between. And if I grow any taller than that, then I'm really out of, now with height, there's nothing I can do. But with width, if I'm a size 32, 34, I could pretty much shop anywhere. Pip, Woolworths, you name it. However, mm -hmm. I become a size 44, maybe I can only shop at certain specialist shops. If I become a size 50, I'm about to expire from any shop that would essentially be able to meet my needs. So, I need to, to think of at which point do I need to change the way that I do something, the, my weight in, essentially in this particular example. Okay. So what I'm saying is that you have to, as an organization, look at how far can you stay as you are before you expire and actually what do you need to do to evolve and change to what your organization will need to succeed in the future. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I, I feel that um, you, we need to be open to change because um, if we want mm. to grow, change has actually got to be a, a prior, in fact, is a priority. Um, in the sense of um, we need to recognize that there can be unrecognized problems, which will mean that we have also got unanticipated solutions because we haven't recognized those problems. And then of course, we then miss out on the opportunities and being open to change and using tech to recognize problems, to anticipate solutions, and also to, to realize the unforeseen opportunities that are up ahead. This becomes critical to how we do anything. Mm. Those are two, okay. maybe my last one, if I can add to that is, is people. I think uh, being human and nurturing human connections has now become more important than ever. I was at an ID seminar yesterday, a webinar, and um, uh, John Jonathan Tallett there said that we had um, 
collaboration technologies had increased. And I, my question to him was, wow, with all these collaboration technologies that we have, you know, Zoom, WhatsApp, you name the platforms, how has this affected our cultural norms of connection? Mm. Just a question out yeah. there. So people, I yeah, feel, I think, are um, important. Mm. Very much so, and I think we, we are only going to see the, the impact of how those cultural and uh, communication norms have changed in, in the future, because, yeah, we, we're still very much uh, walking that path and journey as, as we speak. So, Audrey, um, I, I loved what you mentioned, and you, you kind of brought those three points across there around evolving or expiring, being open to change, and then obviously the importance of people. Um, I wondered if, if maybe you could just expand a little bit and maybe even share uh, a customer journey or customer story of how you are able to assist a partner with navigating through those, th those three steps in that journey. So I want to share a couple of examples. Actually, the one is probably around people. Now, um, having come from a skills development mm -hmm. area, um, I think the question I would ask to, to the audience is, when was the last time you were productive and efficient when you are unhappy or uncertain? And if people are in an organization or even in a finance department, the key, um, uh, the key deliverers of productivity or efficiencies, yes, I know we've got uh, robotic, robotic process automation that we are putting into place. And I loved what uh, Marley said that, if there are some mundane functionalities that we are doing day in, day out, really let's use our tech to do that and leave the higher order function work to people. Now, I can tell you now, I can wrote, create a macaroni cheese if I'm unhappy. However, if I want to do a beef bourguignon, you know, I'm probably going to need all my faculties around me and to be in the right frame of mind. So um, I think what I remember an organization um, taking on Oracle as, as a new product and a new function. And, and in fact, it was at the time, many years ago, it was actually VITS. And they took on EBS and, we, and they started go flying. However, they had all these lecturers and professors who were suddenly having to use a system to order things. And because they weren't really tech savvy or they hadn't really been using computers in there, they were completely unhappy. And as unhappy people and users of the system, it, it literally almost made the project not a success. So we went in there into, yeah. in, into the organization and actually went, went onto the skills development and, and tried to handhold all the very resistant um, users to adopt the system. So I think, you know, change management is one of those areas that we find we don't always focus on, even in finance, it is necessary. Um, another journey that I'd like to probably say is, you know, as, as um, a, 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 an IT provider and as a partner of choice, we would like to be for our customers. It's, you, you know, when, we, when our sales teams arrive at our customers, Often there might be a resistance to say, well, these guys just want to sell us things. But I think what we would, we, we want to put out there is to say, and we've done that with a couple of organizations now, especially with COVID-19 is to say, we are the partner of, we are a partner of choice that understands our customer, not only to what the customer needs now, but to what a customer will need tomorrow. So say, for example, at, um, at Sasa, we've just been there discussing with them what their current architecture looks like. And we've said, here's a path to, to digital transformation. We don't know what COVID is going to look like in 2021. You know, we are, we are so used to that human interaction of, of goggles going off to an office and filling out a form with somebody there. Now we want them to fill out their form on their cell phones at home. And most of them have, have a phone. How do we as, a, as, as, as an organization help our customers 
to trans to digitally transform not only their back office but their front office as well so that their customers begin to benefit from the tech changes that you make and so those are some of the journeys that we we work you know walk on with our customers that's great thank you thanks Audrey. thanks for sharing in our previous conversation you you brought up something that i thought was quite interesting because we obviously don't have the ability to kind of see into the future and you mentioned something which was that you through the the tools and software that oracle provide you have an opportunity to recognize unrecognizable problems so i'd love for you to expand a little bit on that i think that could be of great value to our, our finance professionals here today so having come from really old school Oracle and seeing what we have now in the latest Oracle cloud platform, the dashboards that we deliver allow one to pick up a tablet, to pick up their, their you know, open up their screen and log in and see immediately where the problems are about to happen, especially when you've done planning. So it starts from the planning and the budgeting area, you know, that scenario planning where you've got different drivers to say, okay, we're now at November, we have, we're, we're not in lockdown. Should lockdown happen again in February? What will that look like? What will my figures look like? What sales do I need to have done by then? So scenario planning really becomes important and there are such amazing tools to do that. And then, of course, once you've done all that scenario planning, you plug those figures in, they get mapped to the actuals. And when you open up your dashboards, you can see immediately, oh, there looks like there's a drop in revenue there. Uh, there looks like there might be a, an increase in cost there, depending on all the information that, that we have. And one of the things that I was reading up on the other day, it says, you know, you know, data mining experts are all here and they're doing wonderful things. And I'm going, Data mining, I mean, it just boggles my mind. I'm, although I'm a finance person, I'm incredibly artistic. It's just like, please don't ask me to do that. But we have tools like predictive analytics, yeah. which takes all of that stuff off my shoulders, puts it on some expert and some tech, and allows me to, as a user, l see those analytics upfront before I even start delving into what changes I need to make into the system. So I think that, you know, when you have problems that you could miss or even unseen opportunities yeah. that you would not have, the analytics, the predictive analytics, the dashboards that we provide certainly help to speed up your data insights. Mm, that's awesome. I can see how that really adds value and gives you a, a bit of a, a glimpse of the future. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And um, a leg Audrey, up, you can call it that. Yeah, for sure. Audrey, I wondered if you have some um, of your, your 20 year tenure at Oracle, like we mentioned earlier as we started, you've seen some patterns. I wondered if you perhaps had some tips for our finance professionals here to, to ensure that we stay relevant in finance? What, what knowledge could you impart? Well, I think one of the things that you find on a, on a down uh, scale, on a down, on a down like we are at the moment, is that we, we pull back on training. We pull back on people development. We pull back on upskilling. And I think that's where I, I feel like we shouldn't because often change requires skill whether it be a system change yeah. or an organizational change so i think there's both tech and soft skills that needs to be a, continue to be a priority in organizations you know in the old days when i was contracting you know you'd get a big contract to train you know 800 users over a space of six weeks and if something happened and the markets flopped and there was suddenly no more money to be like, oh, can we cut that back? You know, I know we were going to give them four days of training, but can we drop it to only half a day? Because I'm sure we, I'm sure they can learn what they need to do in that amount of time. So I think um, people yeah. are important. And if people are going to be okay. productive and efficient in your environment, certainly um, training and change management is important. The other is that uh, digital transformation is here to stay. Um, you can either be a leader or you can lag. 
and you know sometimes you want to just be in the middle there but how do you know um uh, 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 yesterday i was at a, at this webinar and this gentleman put up four credit cards from facebook amazon apple and one other i can't remember who the other one is and i go oh my gosh facebook is going to provide a bank now that changes the competitive landscape completely yeah. now are our are, 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 are finance uh, people aware of the changing competitive landscape and how, how they're going to stay ahead if they don't have the tools to do that? Um, that's the second thing. And then the other thing that I learned, uh, which this is a, this was just fun for me, that uh, demographics are important, especially in the financial services sector. And, um, you know, in the old days, we used to say, how do we know if you're old? Well, it probably means you've got a brick of a phone or you don't know how to use a smartphone. That's how you know that you're old. Well, yesterday I learned that actually, you know that you're old when, if you want to do some banking, you actually phone the bank and you want to speak to somebody. You don't want to just talk to a chat, chat, dot, chat yeah. bot or an automated voice thing. You know, and, and, and the, um, uh, the, the issue is that the young, hip and upcoming demographic people, you know, group, they're quite happy to just talk to a chatbot and sort out their banking. I'm afraid I'm a little old. I actually want to speak to somebody who tells me what my interest rates are doing, who tells me yeah. what my values are doing. I mean, most of the time I'm happy to bank on my phone, but every now and then when there's a big issue, I want to talk to someone. So demographics are something that we're going to have mm -hmm. to really look at, not only in our internal finance teams as to what, what the makeup of that is, but also as organizations to our customers and be relevant to the demographic that we are servicing. Perfect. That's very useful. And we can see a lot of similarities around uh, what Marla was saying as well, specifically around the, the importance of people. Um, and then just being that sort of agile finance professional who can kind of adapt and evolve. So I see we've received a couple of questions in the chat. So Marla, I'm going to invite you to turn your camera back on for us, please. And thank you so much. Um, I see the, the first question we had here. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll come to you first, Marla, and then we'll come to you next, Audrey. It's from uh, Narissa Subramani, and she's asking around how virtual workplace activities, have they created a better and happier working environment? Oh, that's a loaded question, yeah. eh? Um, look, I, I do think, like in anything in life, you know, every everything has two sides, you know, so stuff have positives and negatives, you know, so... I do think people are sort of can't wait to get back to work, you know, because um, so so I think you know like with everything in life, the extreme is not not good, you know. So just working from home is not great, and maybe just working from work is also not great for people. Mm -hmm. I think the positives around um, working from home, like for me especially, on a Monday morning, if I don't have to sit in the traffic, I yeah. think any other day is sort of okay, but you know, on a Monday morning, because you get that little bit of a school feeling that is there a test today that I should have studied for over the weekend and I didn't study, you know, if you yeah. have to get into traffic, you know. So so I think certainly, you know, um, people embrace the fact that they didn't have to waste all this time in traffic, you know. So I, th so I think that was a great win, you know, in terms of, um, and, and it does, I mean, you don't actually realize how much stress and sort of um, tiredness traffic adds to your life. You know, yeah. if you if you do it every day, you're just used to it. But when you don't need to sit in the traffic, then you actually realize it. So, so I think that's definitely been something work from home has has given us is that that less traffic. Um, but but I do think people miss the engagement. You know, so I, so I think going back to work, I think most of us work in organizations where there's flexibility, you know, and we've always seen it like there's flexibility, but but I do think it's going to change significantly, you know, where people are going to work from home, you know, a bit more, um, but with that balance of going into the office and, and having the ability to engage with people face-to-face, -face. because I think we, we are 
mostly sociable beings, you know. So we do like to see people and chat to people face to face, you know, and not through a screen, you know. So 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 I think we need to keep the best of both, you know, where yeah. you know um you reduce some of your traveling time by working mm -hmm. from home, but then you can also go into the office and have that personal relationship and engagement. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marla. Thank you so much. And Audrey, some of the maybe changes or observations you've you've made in your team in terms of, oh, and, and I guess with your clients as well around uh, the happiness and working from home. So, I mean, I actually work from home uh, mm. and I go into the office for my uh, dose of interaction. Okay. Um, I think it was it, it was interesting because we were I was used to that. But what I found that with everybody else going online, suddenly my 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 online workload ballooned yeah. um, to the point where also, you know, it, when you're at the office and you're creating a meeting invite, you have a meeting 10 to 11 mm -hmm. and then there's five minutes or 10 minutes to walk between that and the next minute and the next meeting. Sorry. Online, there just hasn't been that. You know, people have just yeah. seen you know space in your diary and you've been filled up yeah. and I go. Suddenly, we are humans that don't need the bathroom, that don't need a coffee break, that don't need to, you know, touch up our lipstick. You know, there's just all these things that we seem to forget when we are booking meetings. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so what we have done, uh, certainly what I've done, is I've sort of blocked out sometimes sort of ten minute slots, just so that I can I can get a comfort break. Mm. But um, I found that our customers. <laughs> The one customer, we were having a presentation and he was sitting in his car and we're like, oh, my goodness, why are you in your car? And he goes, it's my birthday and the children are baking up a storm. So I can't be in the house. <laughs> I've been relegated to the car to take my call. Crazy. <laughs> So um, I, I, I just hope that those of us who are working virtually now, which who weren't used to it, are finding ways to balance it yeah. um, because you know, I didn't realize that Zoom fatigue was actually a real thing until mm. I started experiencing. I thought, I, I work like this all the time. Why am I suddenly overtired? And then I realized it was just because I used to have one or two or three meetings a day online. Now it was eight or nine meetings online. Mm. So I think it's about each and every single one of us looking at our lives and going, have a balance. Yes, productivity is important. Meetings are important. But balance is sure. also important. You need to make time to see the people that are at home with. I mean, I think in the first three weeks of lockdown, I didn't see my kids, you know, and then I thought they're all here for a change because they're normally at boarding school. They're all here for a change and I barely have lunch with them. So mm -hmm. I started just blocking out 30 minutes to have lunch with them. And then of course, dinner is normal. We always used to eat together. Yeah. Balance. Okay. Yeah, and I guess that kind of leads into what um, Judith is asking there, both of uh, Marla and Audrey. She's saying that how do we find the time to stay relevant um, when we've got such busy and demanding roles and we're doing a year's worth of forecasting in two weeks or, you know, Audrey, from your side, you've got kids at home and your meetings have just ballooned. How do you actually, do you physically structure that time in your calendar? What, what do you do? Well, actually, go ahead, Molly. No, you can go, Audrey. <laughs> so I have actually blocked out in my diary uh, 30 minutes every day. It just says okay. in my diary, break. I mean, I'm the only one that sees what it is. And then if someone books a meeting that sort of overlaps that break, sometimes I'll just move it later or I'll move it earlier. But I've actually scheduled time in my day to have just 30 minutes of a break. And that one is specific. Mm -hmm. If anything else gives me time off, great. Yeah, okay, perfect. And yourself, Marlene? I, d I do something similar where I block some time in my diary out, you know, um, just to, to get some time to think. Also, you know, I, I'm a keen runner, you know, so, and I say to people, you know, my running is actually, it's actually working because I think a lot, you know, when I'm mm. running. You know, so um, so it's actually not really recre recreational. It is actually working because that's when you know I, I do a lot of my thinking. You know, so so I do think it is important to set aside time. You know, you yeah. you have to be disciplined. You know, and set aside time to to think. Mm. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. I see Narissa Chetty is asking um, a question, and it's going to be very interesting to get both of your different viewpoints here because, Marla, you'll be speaking from a leader's perspective and how you are able to assist your team and your employees with kind of upskilling from maybe older manual interventions to more kind of digital and, and I guess, automated processes. And then, Audrey, we can hear how you've managed to do that from a client support perspective as well. Yeah, I think from a leader's perspective, you know, um, the big thing is that what we're trying to do is is to to show people imagine if, you know, imagine if you don't need to sit there every morning and retrieve this and, you know, pivot this and then put this in a journal and then post it, you know, like imagine if, you know, what you can do, you know, um, and, and I mean, you can ask anyone who works, you know, they always say to you, how busy they are, you know, because every morning I have to do this and this. And then imagine if I can take that away from you. You know, some people say, no, but this only takes me 10 minutes. But you've got like, you've got eight tasks or 10 tasks that only takes you 10 minutes. That's two hours of your day, you know. Yeah. And and sometimes it doesn't go just 10 minutes. You know, it goes, you know, you have to investigate a bit. So it's two hours in your day, which you can then do your thinking or, you know, do some insights, you know, and and come up with nice ideas for your business, you know. So so that's certainly what we try to tap into, you know, is to say to people, imagine if, you know, what else you can do if you don't have to do this manual thing. Because sometimes people are a bit scared, to be quite honest, because they think if you're going to get the bot or if you get this thing automated, you know, what about my job? Because that's what I know how to do. But, and I think that's what it is about is to show people what else they can do, you know. And and in this world, we also have to keep on upskilling our people, you know. Um, so it is about also spending time with people. I must say, I, for me, you know, a lot of learning comes through exposure. You know, sure. if you think about like an Excel course, yes, it's good and you can learn. But think about how much you've learned about Excel by sitting with someone. You know, and I mean, I, I learn stuff daily almost, you know, by sitting with people, you know, it's just like, oh, what did you do now that was so quick, you know, and then they're like, no, I just, and then I'm like, oh, now I've learned something new, you know, so, yeah. so exposure is a great way for people to learn. So if you can free them up from some of those tasks, they get that half an hour to maybe sit with one of their colleagues, just show me what you're doing, you know, and in that you don't just learn about what they're doing. You also learn about how they're doing it mm -hmm. and how they're thinking, the questions they ask. And that's what grows you, you know, and yeah. that's what prepares you for different roles and makes you better in your current role, you know. Sure. And sharing the, the wealth of knowledge amongst the team as well, which is also great. Exactly. Thanks, Marley. Audrey, what would you add to that? Well, Marley, actually, you took the words right out of my mind mouth because that's what we do as well you know we go to our customers and say imagine if you could do this better in fact you can do it better imagine if you could free up your resources to do the data insights so i think we pretty much uh, marley you must be the leader that we want to speak to all the time because we are already singing our mantra imagine if your people could do things this way and that way and in fact that that monthly close can be sort of brought down to two days, two, three days. Um, and so it's a, it's the same from our side. Perfect. Thank you, Audrey. One of the questions that we uh, got in the build-up to this webinar was from Ricardo De Freitas. And he was just asking about uh, additional tools and resources, maybe some online areas where you can upskill, um, you can ensure that you're doing courses to remain relevant. I know, Marley, you obviously mentioned uh, CFO.co.za, we, we publish a lot of content. You've done courses through Harvard. Audrey, you spoke about a webinar that, that you attended yesterday as well. So what, what would be your, your go-to channels um, to ensure you, you remain relevant in finance? And let's start with, with you, Audrey, and then we'll come to you, Marley. So I use LinkedIn Learning quite a bit. Okay. Um, there's, there's there's quite a lot of different things there and 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 what i love about it is that it's not just technical because i think what we forget is that we are human beings who have so many facets and sometimes it's about learning something that is a soft skill that you can use with the people around you so mm -hmm. i love that it's got you know 
learn photography, which I haven't done, of course. Yeah. But I mean, it, yeah, and you know, strategic thinking or or business writing or you know, certain. There's lots of different things. Um, and I must say, I what I love to do most is to learn something, and then call my colleagues on a Zoom or something and say, let me show you how to do this. You know, okay. um, because that then cements my knowledge as well. Mm. Um, when I can tell somebody else how to do it. And you'd be amazed when you think, oh, I know exactly how to do that. When you try and show somebody else how to do it, uh, there's some holes in your knowledge. And that really yeah. helps you then go back and 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 relook at that. So I do a lot of that. And then, of course, we've got um, Oracle Learning um, online, which, okay. um, uh, you know, if you have got um, Oracle, you can subscribe to and you get certain cr uh, uh, cloud credits and you can pretty much learn any of the of the systems that we have. Oh, cool. Perfect. Thanks, Audrey. Yourself, Malay? Yeah, I might say LinkedIn. I also like it. It's a great source of all sorts of different things, you know. So, um, so definitely that is. Um, at Investec, we also just rolled out you know, a, a new um, online learning stuff. So we we haven't used it that much, but we've sort of designed it, you know, in terms of from a finance perspective, in terms of what we would like to see in there. So I'm really excited about what that's going to bring. Um, and then, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff, you know, in terms of sharing, you know. So I feel like, you know, sharing is 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 almost caring in this environment, you know, but like, you know, from any of like, you know, from from the executives that you you serve with, you know, sharing articles or new ways from the tech community. I mean, my my tech partner shares a lot with me around what she sees is, is new. You know, so sharing is quite nice, and it's also nice to to pass those those things on to your teams. You know, so um, and then obviously what's not online now, but what we've discussed is exposure is a big thing. So if you don't have exposure in your current um, role you need to make ways to make it happen and don't wait for it to come to you you have to go and find opportunities to expose yourself you know so either ask someone in your team can I sit with you ask your leader you know um, you what meetings do you go to you know would you mind taking me to one of those meetings you know so so exposure is very very important you know so you know, find ways to get yourself exposed, you know, to because you learn so much in terms of a variety of, because for me, it's about the way people think almost more than yeah. what they think, you know, because that's what sort of triggers your mind in mm. terms of, you know, oh, I must actually never thought that way, you know, mm. and that's what actually triggers you to start thinking differently, to approach things from different angles and makes what you do and how you do it a lot richer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Marla. Thank you so much. And Audrey, thank you very much. What was the thing you wanted to add, Audrey? I was just going to add yeah. about in terms of that, to say a mentor is something really? that is really vital. And I think I probably want to speak to those that are in senior leadership to say when somebody does come and ask you to mentor them, don't shy away saying, well, I'm not good enough or I'm too busy. I think you could always share some experience with a younger person, but young people or those that are not necessarily as experienced, you know, ask. They can only say no. Yeah. Or they yes. probably won't say no. So there you go. <laughs> there's, your, there's your daily boost of motivation from Marley and Audrey. So Marley and Audrey, I'd really like to thank you both for your time here this morning. Thank you for uh, Marley and sharing the Investec story with us. Thank you for sharing some of your tips. Audrey, thank you so much for giving us a, a glimpse of your journey and sharing some of those kind of best practices to, to help us get through these challenging uh, times ahead. And most importantly, to help us uh, remain relevant in finance. One of the other ways that we can continue to remain relevant in finance is, of course, by attending the Finance and Java Network webinars. So you'll see we've got uh, a couple more scheduled for next week. You'll see we've got uh, SA's Ultimate Innovation Showcase, where we'll have Clive Butko, Thomas Pays, and Sasha Matlovich. We'll be talking about various different uh, disruptors and how you can gain growth there. We'll then have a webinar coming up, which is all about smart finance for imports and exports, hosted by NetBank CRB. 
And you can register for all of these events at cfo.co.za forward slash events. Uh, I would also like to take an opportunity to thank Oracle for partnering with us on this webinar. We really value and appreciate the long-term um, support and partnership we've had. Thank you very much to the CFO community and the Finance and Darwin Network community for joining us here today. And of course, Marle and Audrey, thank you so much for your time once again. Great to see you and thank you for sharing your knowledge. Have Thanks for having time. us. Thank Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers, Bye everybody. Time. Looking forward to seeing you in another online session soon. Take care and ciao for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.